This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 8th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, at Michael's request, our top three becomes a top four. These are the issues. First, we discussed Ledge Finance's presentation to the Senate Finance Committee last week. It was great as far as it went, but it had one huge hole. Second, we explain how an op-ed in the Republican mouthpiece Must Read Alaska signals a deepening split among fiscal conservatives. Third, we explain why we believe the latest round of federal relief eliminates the need for Governor Dunleavy's supplemental PFD. And finally, we explain where the spending cuts would need to be made if the governor or the legislature was going to try to balance the budget through cuts only, either entirely or even mostly. And now, let's join Michael. So let's talk a little bit about the weekly top three. Ledge Finance provided an important update uh, to Senate Finance uh, from last week, and you have got a fiscal uh, look at all the back projections, and, and you supplemented everything that they were talking about. Uh, let's start off with a weekly top three here. Yeah. So uh, if you haven't uh, been following Alaska's f- fiscal situation for the last decade and you wanted one presentation to sort of bring you up to speed and set the stage for where we go from here, uh, last Thursday, Ledge Finance, Alexi Painter, um, uh, the director of Ledge Finance, did – uh, what I think is an outstanding job uh, gathering all of the uh, data from the last uh, uh, five years, breaking it down by spending category, by, by uh, 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 agency, um, and summarizing it, and then bringing it forward, looking at where we are now, and then taking it forward uh, for the next 10 years. And it's just, I, I, this, this, this presentation uh, in terms of of stage setting, uh, I think is uh, is probably one of the one of the best I've I've seen. Um, we're we're going to talk about some of the spending categories and and some of the past spending and where that puts us uh, in our in our bonus segment today. What I want to do in this segment is 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 concentrate on a couple of things. One, uh, if you if you start at page twenty three. Uh, of, uh, of Alexi's presentation, of this presentation, you'll see uh, what the Senate Finance Committee wants you to see uh, about where, where the state's headed. And, and it's a true picture. I'm, I, I, I say it's what the Senate Finance Committee wants you to see, and I'll explain that in a moment. But it's a true picture of where we're headed, uh, what the numbers tell us uh, where we're headed over the next decade. And, and the thing about this presentation is it uses the PFD um, as the as the, um, uh, the 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 expansion or the contraction tool. If 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 we have enough money, uh, it pays a PFD. If we don't have enough money, it doesn't pay the PFD. Um, and and shows you what the what the state's position is uh, in terms of balancing the budget uh, going forward using the using the PFD in that fashion. Right. Um, and, and basically, over the next uh, what it shows is over the next ten years, uh, <laughs> what what Senate Finance wants you to to take away from this presentation is that over the next five years, you can you can't really afford to pay a PFD. The only case, and they and they run through statutory PFD, 
50 50 um, uh, 50 POMV 50 50 which is the governor's proposal a thousand dollars set set rate at a thousand dollar PFD and a set rate at a 500 PF five hundred dollar PFD uses Department of Revenue revenue projections uses uh, the governor's own projections of spending which includes then his step down over the next three years his cuts about six hundred million dollars and cut 400 million dollars in cuts over the next three years um uses all that and then walks through uh where we are from a from a revenue uh, uh standpoint and from a spending standpoint and in every case uh the uh statutory the the 50 50 pomv 50 pomv 50 50 the thousand dollar pfd all show uh, that we continue to be in the red uh, uh, throughout throughout the, the decade. The only case where we don't show fully in the red uh, in all the years is the $500 PFD case, uh, and that shows that we're red for the next couple of years, um, and and shows that there is deficits for the next couple of years. But after the after the again using the governor's proposed budget, after the step down in spending, it shows that. Uh, that we might be able to afford uh, a $500 uh, PFD uh, based upon the revenue forecast and, and the governor's proposed uh, spending forecast. The, the problem with this presentation, it, it's a great presentation in terms of those numbers, in terms of showing you, j just j instead of the PFD, just assume that they're showing you the deficits. And it's a great presentation in terms of showing those deficits. Here's my problem with the presentation, and, I, and, and, and the reason we've done um, uh, two supplementals, I, I went out and hired some help to, to, to be able to analyze these things, uh, and the reason we've done two supplementals uh, to the budget. It shows you, it, it uses the PFD, cutting the PFD as the way of balancing the budget. It doesn't assess the impact of using the PFD cuts uh, as a way of balancing the budget on Alaska families, and it doesn't assess the impact of using the PFD cuts as a way of balancing the budget on the overall Alaska economy. We've got the tools to do that, uh, to be able to assess the impact on Alaska families and to be able to assess the impact uh, on, on the overall economy. Uh, we've got two studies from ITEP. Uh, the Institution for Taxation and Economic Policy, one in 2017 and, and one that they just did in 2020, that enable us to look at the impact of using PFD cuts by um, uh, income bracket, the effect on Alaska families. And, and we've got tools from a, from a 2016 study that ICER did um, uh, that enable us to look at the impact on the overall Alaska economy. So we did two supplements. Uh, uh, one focused on the distributional impact, the impact on Alaska families, and the other uh, showing the impact on the overall Alaska economy. Um, and I would, I would commend those. You can find them on our uh, Facebook page. You can find them on our LinkedIn page. You can find them on our Twitter page. Uh, uh, you can find them on our SlideShare page. They're, they're all over the place. I would commend anybody who really wants to, to, to take the next step beyond what Ledge Finance did and go look at those studies. And and the the here's the conclusion uh, of the two studies. From the standpoint of of, of Alaska families, using uh, PFD cuts as a way of financing the budget, as a way of financing these deficits that 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 Ledge Finance is projecting, results in lower and middle. Same thing we've been saying all, all along, but you can see the numbers in these studies results in middle and lower income Alaska families paying multiple times higher, um, taking, a, taking a, a deeper cut in their income as a result of using PFD cuts by multiple times higher than, than the top 20%. The difference between the, to, the impact on the top 20% as a percent of income, the difference between the impact on the top 20% and the lowest 20% is 10 times. Lower income, the lowest 20% are paying 10 times, are taking are taking an impact that's 10 times to impact of their income, that's 10 times higher than what's happening to the to the top 20%. Um, and and even 
even the upper middle income bracket, the bracket between uh, 60 and 80 percent, still middle income, but but the upper middle income, right before you get to the top 20 percent, they're take they're taking a hit to their income that's two times uh, what the top 20 percent is taking. So. When you look at the impact uh, of, of the distributional impact of using PFD cuts on Alaska families, it's clear that what what's happening when you use PFD cuts to fund government is you're shoving the burden off on middle and lower income Alaska families. The second thing we looked at uh, is the impact of the proposed PFD cuts on the economy, uh, again, using the, the numbers from the ICER 2016 study, and it shows that uh, for example, at uh, using a thousand dollar, cutting the PFD down to a thousand dollars, when you're comparing it to the statutory PFD, the income loss in the state is 1.9 billion dollars, 1.4 times uh, the amount of the PFD cut. You're taking that amount of income out of the state uh, by uh, by cutting the PFD, and you're losing roughly 10,000 jobs, 9,780 9, jobs taking those jobs uh, out of the Alaska economy. Um, and then uh, the, the second thing the ICER study did is to compare the impact of using PFD cuts compared to other revenue sources. Um, and, and we go through uh, that as well uh, in the supplement, showing that using the PFD uh, uh, as, as your income source, using PFD cuts as your income source, as your revenue source, has a larger adverse impact on overall income and on overall jobs. There's more job loss from using the PFD, uh, from using PFD cuts as the way of balancing the budget, as there is from any other uh, revenue source, uh, alternative revenue source that ICER studied. Income taxes, sales taxes, property tax, statewide property tax, all of those do result in income loss and they result in the job loss, but those are, are lower losses, lesser losses than result from, from using PFD cuts. So there's the, 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 the ledge finance study is great in terms of telling you what the deficits are, where we're headed uh, on our current course in terms of deficits, but it doesn't tell you what the, their, their, the implicit proposed alternative that they, that, that, that's in the ledge finance presentation of using PFD cuts, it doesn't answer the question, what's the impact of that on Alaska families and what's the impact of that on the Alaska economy? And we did the supplementals, I think, to, to answer those questions. I think together, that really, all three of those together, the two supplementals and the ledge finance study, give you a, a complete picture of what the alternatives are uh, ahead for uh, Alaska uh, if we continue on the current course we are. Um, I think ledge fin I think the ledge finance presentation sort of just doesn't go doesn't do that last step that needed step that step you're always asking me on on this show which is what does it mean for Alaska what does it mean for Alaska families what does it mean for the Alaska economy right well this um, and that, and that's where these two supplementals come well this is part of the politicians problem right they always look at it uh, like all the upsides on one side of it and they never consider the downsides on the other or the unintended consequences of what they're they're always point painting the rosy picture of well if we do this this is what will happen as if it happens in a vacuum and it has no other impact or at least they ignore the impact that you know of the things that they don't want it to look at i mean this is this is a typical political problem i mean this this happens at every level of government it seems like uh but predominantly here we're seeing this repeat again and again and again. We could solve all these problems if we just take this. Okay, but if you take that, what's the ramifications of taking that? Because there, I mean, there are downstream consequences of all these things. And, uh, you know, at least it, it, we need to have an equitable look at, okay, if you do take that, what are the impacts and, and what are, but nobody wants to talk about it. all the legislators. None of the legislators are talking about the, you know, what, what is, what is the true impact on Alaska families? What does it mean for job losses? What does it mean for all these other things? Nobody is just talking about that. They're all looking at, well, how much money can we get out of it to stop the bleeding? That's pretty much it. Yeah. It's a pre, it's a pre cooked result. I mean, if, if, if you assume that that you're going to use PFD cuts. If that's the pre-cooked result, then then you don't you don't look at anything else. The the, the problem is, and and my point is, 
that that those pre-cooked results have the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and have the largest adverse impact of all the alternatives uh, on uh, all the revenue alternatives on the overall Alaska economy. And 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 so you you need to you need to step through that pre-cooked result and say, well, is that the best? Is that the best result? Uh, is that right. the best alternative we can pursue? I mean, isn't this the typical politician's problem, Brad, where they they see a solution and it's outcome based, like you said. I want this outcome, so I'm going to do whatever to justify getting to this outcome. Again, not looking at any of the other factors that may throw a negative light on the outcome that I want. I'm not going to I'm going to ignore all that. I mean, the ICER report, it's been out. You and I were talking about the ICER report the 2014, 2015, 2016, they've redone it several times. We kept talking about it, and they're like, oh, yeah, no, yes, nod, put them all in rocking chairs. Yep, yep, nod, nod, nod. We need to do that. And nothing ever happens, and 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 they never acknowledge that of all the levers of government that they could pull, all the levers of revenue that they could pull, that they keep pulling the worst one, and and nobody is willing to acknowledge that. Yeah, it's it, – it, it, let, let's divide. Let's divide this 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 piece from OM, from uh, ledge finance into two pieces. One, giving us a, an, a view, a comprehensive view of where we've been, where we are now, and where we're going. It is excellent at that. That we need to acknowledge that. We need to use it for that. Um, but then the second layer on piece is to say, okay, so where we're going is a bunch of deficits. We run through all of our savings. When we look, when we look in the past, we've run through all of our savings. Where we're going is on, on even with the governor's proposed spending, is a bunch of deficits, um, and and how do we and 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 sort of you know stop there. That's where the sort of the ledge ledge finance piece stops, and then you layer on you know what what Bert wanted them to say, what Natasha wanted them to say, which is and we fill those holes with the PFD with with PFD cuts, uh, and this is this is how deep the PFD cuts have to go. Uh, to be able to uh, to be able to fill those holes, uh, that is uh, that is uh, uh, trying to control the narrative. That is trying to prejudge the solutions, um, and it and it's doing it in a way that doesn't consider the impact on Alaska families or the impact on the Alaska economy. All of that's bad, but the first part of it, you know, painting the picture of where we've been, where we are now. Uh, and where we're headed if we stay on the same track. I think I think that is hugely valuable, uh, and the job that Ledge Finance, the job that Alexi's done in putting and bringing that together, I think is uh, is incredibly important and and incredibly useful. No, I mean I would agree with that. Again, we just need to find a way to get the counter narrative out there yep. that says there is you know there are uh, consequences to your actions. They do not happen in a vacuum, which I think is one of the kind of the reactions right. that we're seeing right now. Is right, that right. if we do right. this, it fixes everything. There's no downside. There is a downside. <laughs> we keep pointing it out, and you keep missing it. Brad Keithley is our guest. Uh, that was a meaty, meaty segment uh, here. Uh, he got through a lot of stuff. I've posted up links to the slide decks in the uh, chat room. If you haven't had a chance to see them, you need to go take a look at them. I've posted the slide decks up in the chat room, and as you said, you can go find them out on Facebook. Uh, we're about to jump into the next segment, Brad. This is a true look behind the curtains at people who call themselves conservatives but in the long run are not. We're going to talk about the opinion piece and must read from Chris Nyman, which I had to read twice just to be able to pull myself off the ceiling after I read it. Uh, and you want to give us a quick thirty second tease here? Well, I think I think this piece, uh, and particularly the fact it's in must read, uh, is 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 a clear signal that the conservative fiscal, so called fiscal conservatives, are about to split uh, on 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 how to fund state government. Um, and I think it's a great way of, of focusing the discussion uh, about what that split's going to be. Like I said, I had to peel myself up the ceiling after reading this opinion piece in Must Read Alaska, of all places. And it's the article is from a, somebody named Chris Nyman, who I had never heard of. I did some Googling afterwards, and, and Chris has written a few other opinion pieces around town. Uh, I don't. I don't know him from Adam. I, he doesn't appear to really be any anything other than somebody who just is offering their opinion. But the headline is: "It's time to suspend the dividend," and Brad points to it as an example of what's happening with what he considers to be a coming conservative split. Brad, well, here's here's 
the, the setup to that. You, you take the ledge finance, you look at where we're headed, um, and, and if you assume, as, I, as, as we've argued in the past, argued about in the past, uh, and, and certainly a lot of people don't want to assume it, but if you assume for the moment that, that there's no political will to cut spending, uh, frankly, there's no political will to cut spending even the way the governor has proposed in this budget, but if you assume there's no political will to cut spending down, down to traditional revenues, you, you face a future – uh, where you've got to have revenues, um, and you've, 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 we've run through savings. There's no savings left. The ERA is just really taxes on or draining the uh, making overdraws on the ERA is just taxes. It's another way of getting revenues is taxes on future generations. You've got to have revenues, and and here's where I see this article fitting fitting into that. There are there are some when faced with this future. Uh, when faced with the future of, of savings being gone, um, uh, even with uh, Governor Dunleavy's cuts, uh, continued uh, uh, deficits, when faced with this future, there are some, uh, as I do, that argue we ought to look at a range, an alter- a range of alternative revenue sources uh, and pick those that have the least adverse impact on Alaska families and on the overall Alaska economy. And there are others that, uh, that that take an alternative tra- track and say, look, the PFD spending, it's, it was nice while we had it, but we just ought to cut it, wipe it out, uh, and that solves the budget problem. And if you look at the, the, the ledge finance presentation to, to, to Senate finance, yeah, cutting the, eliminating the budget does solve the, the budget problem, uh, assuming – Governor Dunleavy's uh, uh, spending cuts are, are put in place. It does solve the budget problem. I think I think there's a huge, and, and we've talked about this before with uh, with Kelly Merrick and Sarah Rasmussen. I think there's a huge split uh, on the conservative, on the so-called fiscal conservative side uh, uh, that that's facing us as we as we confront this future between those who say just get rid of the PFD, like Natasha who say just get rid of the PFD, no, ta- no quote, taxes, and what they really mean is other taxes because PFD cuts are taxes, no other taxes, uh, just get rid of the PFD and we'll be fine, just use it as the last um, uh, safety valve um, and, 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 and we'll be fine. You know, we get through the next 10 years, uh, next 10 years just fine. Um, I, think there's, I think there's a split between those who go down that road and those who go down the road I've been on which is wait a second. Uh, we if we're if we're going to go down this road, we ought to pick a path down this road that has the least adverse impact on the overall economy and the least adverse impact on Alaska families. Is fairest, is most equitable to Alaska families. If we're going down this road, that's the analysis we need to use uh, and look at uh, look at uh, alternatives. And and I think there's a real split. I mean, you can see it. I can see it. With, with, with what Rasmussen and Merrick have done, going on House Finance and saying they're going to oppose taxes, and by that what they really mean uh, are taxes other than PFD cuts, because both right. of them have voted, have voted for PFD cuts in the past. Well, and this is what we were talking about earlier uh, when, before you came on the show, that I was saying, you know, we're, we're going to do this, this segment at the end uh, because, you know, we're going to look for some specific cuts, because you and I have been talking about cuts for years. And you, uh, uh, maybe being the more pragmatic and less uh, idealistic of the two of us, um, have come to the conclusion that there just there is not the political will. And so, what you're looking for is you're looking for the least worst option um, for Alaskans moving forward. That's why you've talked about these these other forms of taxation. But there are other people out there who want to avoid that pain. And because they can do that, they're just going to say, well, let's just take the PFD and that'll solve all the problem. Ignoring the, the impacts of it, ignoring all the impacts you just talked about in, in the first segment, ignoring all the other things, the fact that it's a tax and everything else. And they, and they, they blatantly admit it. This guy, Chris Nyman, gets in here and the first thing he says here is that he goes, here are five, these are the five most popular misconceptions about the permanent fund dividend, that you are owed a permanent fund. That the dividend is the people's money. That reducing or eliminating the dividend is a tax. That the dividend is a beneficial boost to the economy. And that reducing the dividend is unfair to low-income Alaskans. Now, he never it, this he lays those out as if these are the these are the points of his whole argument. 
and then he never revisits them. He just states that these are all misconceptions. And as you say, I think that there are people out there like, uh, you know, uh, American Rasmussen who probably believe these things but have never actually – he doesn't give any space to rebutting any of these issues. No, and it's, and it's uh, uh, you know, it's the top 20% – perspective now now that perspective is held by people also in the in in the middle income bracket and probably even by some in the lower income bracket uh i mean it's but it's, but it, it is benefit it is it is the only segment that benefits out of that perspective is the top 20 percent. everybody else loses money alaska overall loses money we lose income we lose jobs we're the poorer for that perspective overall as a state but from the top 20 eh, percent it's just it's free money it's you know we're not entitled to it give it back if i don't have to pay taxes on 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 the rest of my income boy isn't that great give the pfd back i you know i don't i don't care about it that's the perspective that these people come to it with and it's and it's and it's just not I mean, if you if you just scrape a little bit below the surface and just look at the studies that have been done out there, you realize yes, it's beneficial to them, but it's it's it it makes the rest of the state, the rest of the state's families, and the overall Alaska economy worse off. Um, but but you know there are people who just who go down that who go down that perspective, go down Nyman's perspective. It's time to suspend the dividend, and 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 they've got. I mean, it's not just Natasha. It's Natasha and Sarah and Kelly, uh, and you can go on down the list uh, in the legislature of people who are who are taking that perspective. And I, it's just, it's great. It's fine. It's it's the top twenty percent showing that uh, that uh, that you know they they have advocates and they have control. But it's uh, it's at the it's at the it's at the cost of of all Alaska families, and it's the cost of uh, the overall Alaska economy. I guess this is what really chapped me more than anything else, Brad. I mean, look, I studied. I mean, I I, I, I was in debate club in high school, right? I mean, I, I went through this, and this guy lays out all these points and then never comes back to them. He just states it. These are popular misconceptions. Uh, I mean, find me one economist who says that the dividend is not a beneficial boost to the economy. Find me one. Find me one account. Keynesian, Austrian. I don't care where they come from. Find me one economist who says that dumping that amount of money into an economy doesn't benefit it. Uh, you know, reducing the dividend is unfair to low-income Alaskans. It's disproportionate. It is patently un. It, it affects them. ICER, ITEP, they all. It, it affects them the the most. And of course, the argument that the people the dividend is the people's money. Uh, I mean, there's so many things wrong with this article. That's just one, and and we could go through this piece by piece by piece. But, but I mean, Michael, yeah, it's it's in must read. It, yeah, it's it's in the Republican uh, 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 oracle. It's in the Republican uh, news newspaper. It's it is on. She chose to put it on that page, and and that that speaks to me. That speaks more. Volume louder than than the article itself, and she chose to put it on with that title. Right, it's time to suspend the dividend. Well, and I think you and I were talking back and forth when you sent me this article, and I again I peeled myself off the ceiling, and I I mean I like I don't know if she's just if she's just you know looking for a clickbait title, if she's just looking to chum the waters, uh, you know get get more eyeballs through the through the through the website or what, but I mean I can't believe. I mean, I have never spoken to somebody who's a true conserv- fiscal conservative that would look at this and go, "Yeah, that 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 makes sense." No, I mean, nobody would. Uh, oh, Natasha! Will, N- Natasha will tell you she's a fiscal conservative, and that's exactly the title she would have put on. That's true. I mean, I, I guess that's true. Uh, those of us who are true fiscal conservatives would look at her and go, "No, you ain't." You keep using that word. It does not mean what you think it means, right? I mean, that's what it comes down to. I literally had to read this thing twice to say, "What? I mean, what? They, I mean, I, I if if there are conservatives out there, conservative fiscal conservatives who believe what's being said here, I, um, I, I apparently am not. I, I apparently have been using the word conservative wrong all these years. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting. This, the article is interesting for two things. For this op-ed is interesting from from two perspectives. One. That 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 its perspective being being given, I, it, it, we'll we'll talk about it in the segment. But it's a, uh, 
it's a, a, a very interesting perspective. But the second and, and perhaps more important thing is it shows up on must read. Right. Uh, now, if, if must read is anything, it is the Republican mouthpiece uh, in the state, self-proclaimed Republican mouthpiece in the state, um, and and sort of the the insight into the into the governors occasionally, the insight into the administration and what the administration's thinking. For 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 Suzanne for Su- Suzanne to publish this piece uh, on must read, I think. Uh, uh, is uh, is important in its own right, you know, sort of separate and apart from what the piece says. The fact that she's giving it space on must read, I think, is a uh, is an indication that that at least there's some who are who are going this direction. Yeah, no, uh, I, I and I think, although I am I am heartened by the commentary section uh, in this piece. Uh, after this piece, it, it it just basically shreds the entire piece from top to bottom. At least I know that there are some people out there that feel the same way that I feel about this. You want to touch on number three real quick, or uh, we got I, we got about three I, or four minutes here. I do want to do three because I think it's important. Um, Go- Governor Dunleavy has talked a lot about the need for a supplemental PFD because uh, supplemental PFD this year because of the needs of Alaska families. Uh, number three is a is a uh, an analysis I put up on the on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets uh, page that people can go see. But number three w- took a look at the checks that are coming to Alaska uh, as a result of the December and now the March uh, uh, congressional actions uh, to provide uh, 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 stimulus into the into the U.S. economy. The checks that are coming to Alaskans. And compared that to Governor Dunleavy's proposed supplemental PFD, it's I, I was amazed when I did the numbers. The governor proposes a supplemental PFD uh, into the Alaska economy of one point two two five billion dollars. The checks, the stimulus checks that are coming into the Alaska economy, coming into Alaska's hands, checks in hand, cash in hand, into their bank account uh, from the December uh, stimulus from the December. Uh, legislation was 0.368 million from the March, uh, from the newly passed March. Uh, legislation is 8.56 million. You add those two together, they're 1.224 million dollars compared to Governor Dunleavy's proposed 1.225. From from my perspective, what what I think that says is the federal government has done has handled what what the governor proposed with the supplemental uh, PFD. He's put the federal government is putting checks. Into, into the hands of Alaska families uh, in the same amount as the governor proposes. Now, whether the federal government should be doing that, whether we should be going into debt at the federal level to do that sort of stuff, that's that's an entirely different debate. But but from a standpoint of dollars into the Alaska economy, into the hands of Alaska families, the, the federal government has done it. Um, and I think, frankly, the governor, uh, we need to back off talking about this supplemental PFD uh, for, FY, for FY21 because the only way it comes is it comes through a PFD for a permanent fund overdraw and as a tax on future Alaska generations. We don't need to do it anymore. If the governor if the governor's concern was was where Alaska families sit and getting dollars into the hands of Alaska families, the federal government's done it. Uh, and I think and I think we just need to go on by that issue now and go on and start talking about FY twenty two and not be talking about the supplemental PFD anymore. Uh, Kelly asks, isn't the criteria different from the federal government versus the PFD? Um, I, I guess criteria would be attainment criteria, maybe, or, or payment criteria? No, it's, 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 uh, she's talking about the qualification criteria. So That's the what federal I meant, government, yeah. Sorry. The federal government phases out uh, at, uh, I think they finally agreed on $70,000, $70, starts phasing out at $70,000. Or one hundred and forty thousand uh, uh, dollars for uh, a married uh, a married family, and then you know it it it, it goes to children uh, as well. That is somewhat different. So the skew of the federal government payment is almost entirely to middle and lower income Alaska families, as opposed to going to the top twenty percent. They're they're above the criteria. Um, so the skew is a little bit different. Frankly, that puts more money in the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families than what the governor's PFD proposal uh, was going to do. But that's that's where the skew is. Quickly, B- Bill says, so what? Back off the money that's actually owed us? What the hell? I mean, I think that's his question. 30 seconds here. The money the money has already been used. It, it was used to balance the budget 
Uh, it's already been taxed. What, what the governor's proposing to do is go take from, from a pot of money that's set aside for future Alaska generations, take from that and give to the current Alaska generation, tax future Alaska generations. And, I, and, and, and what you're really doing, what he's really proposing to do is take money from future generations and give it to the current generation. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. If Alaska, if Alaskans need more money uh, in order to deal with the current situation, the federal government has done it. Welcome to Hour 2 of the big radio broadcast, The Michael Duke Show. It's Tuesday. Now, normally, we would have just finished up with Brad Keithley for Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, and I would be lamenting the fact that you just joining us have missed uh, some great uh, information and some good discussions with Brad. But today, we're extending that. Today, we've got the extra dose of Keithley. Uh, which uh, I don't know if we need, but we're definitely going to get. That's what's going to happen. Chris Story is not going to be with us today. So I asked Brad to, uh, last week we had a discussion about how people were complaining that we weren't coming up with concrete solutions for cuts. Now, if you've listened to this program for many years, you understood that we've, we've already been through all that. We've talked about it. We've talked about it ad nauseum. Uh, but at some point, Brad had decided that there just wasn't the political will to cut. So he, he changed his tact to talk about uh, you know, the least worst option for those of us out there. If we were going to get a tax, we should at least talk about the one that uh, that benefited Alaskans overall and 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 basically spread the pain, so to speak. Uh, so that's kind of the tack that he's been taking. But as a favor to me, he's decided to come back on and get go over it with us one more time, talk about the various cuts that could be done. And hopefully you guys are going to be taking notes out there and sharing this segment with your legislators because that's what we need. If, we, if we're going to create the political will, we need to have a battle plan. Chris, uh, uh, Brad Keithley comes on this morning with us to share it in this special extra dose of Keithley here at the top of Hour 1. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, Michael. How are you doing now? Yeah, I'm doing fine. It's all great, man. It's just good. It's it's fantastic. All right, so let's dive into this here. This is uh, our chance to uh, to answer a few questions, to talk to a few people. You know, again, you you've taken a lot of heat because all you ever talk about is taxes, and I think I just lined out why you're talking about taxes now. But again, six seven years ago, you and I were talking about this, and we were talking specifically about cuts because at the time. ICER had been talking about the sustainable budget levels. It was, you know, $4.1 billion was the sustainable budget level. And every few months, it'd have to be ratcheted back down. Then it was four, then it was 3.9, then it was 3.8. None of the legislators were looking, but here we are. Uh, so let's dive back into that. Let's go into the Wayback Machine, Brad, and now apply that template to today's budget. Uh, where could we be cutting? If we're going to cut back in the size and scope of state government to make it uh, you know, the expenditures match the revenues. Where should we be looking in Brad Keithley's mind? Well, Michael, there's a great there's a great source to go to uh, as we have this discussion. It's in the ledge finance, as I, as I keep saying, last last week's ledge finance uh, uh, presentation is a great, great source of information. One of the things they did uh, in in the course of explaining how we got to where we are is is walk through the budget um, uh uh, from 2015 to 20 to, to current day, the fiscal year 15 to current day, and walk through it by spending category, by agency, by uh, by statewide item total, and 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 they lined it up with those that cost the most to those that cost the least. They show the amount that's been cut or added since FY18, and then there's a second chart right behind that. It does the same thing, it focuses it in on the last five years from FY18 to FY22. The reason they use FY15 as a starting point was that was the peak spend um, uh, in, uh, in the state's history uh, uh, and, and, and really was, the, was the, the, the peak of the mountain or the, or the depth, whichever way you want to do this, uh, of, uh, of where we were. Um, and that's a, that's a great tool to use. Uh, to identify where cuts need to be made. The top five spending categories, and once you get out of these top five, uh, frankly, you're, you're, you're in the weeds. You're not, you're not finding enough dollars to really, to really move the, uh, the needle. And remember, the objective we're going toward is we're, we're facing $2 billion deficits, uh, 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 even with the governor's spending cuts. Uh, if Oil prices hold at the at the level they are now. We've cut that down 
maybe four hundred million dollars, so we're facing one point six billion as opposed to as opposed to two billion, but we're facing huge deficits. So you you've got to be going, you got to be looking for uh, uh, big pots of money. The top five in terms of spending uh, are are and and this is this is using FY twenty two numbers are education and early development K through twelve. Health and social services, uh, 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 the largest portion of which is Medicaid. Corrections, uh, corrections has actually increased uh, uh, spending over the past. Uh, uh, well, since 2015, it's increased. It, it's corrections has increased by 15 percent uh, over the past five years. Corrections has increased by 21 percent. So corrections is now the third largest. Th- this, these are our prisons. Uh, this is the, that's the third largest category of state spending. Fourth largest is the University of Alaska, and it's been cut a lot uh, already. It's down 31 percent since 2015. Uh, it's down 19 percent since uh, 2018, uh, but it's still the fourth largest category of state spending. And public safety, uh, 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 our, our the, the state police, and all that goes with it, uh, is the fifth largest uh, category of state spending. Once you get beyond that, uh, you're talking about transportation, which is uh, which has been cut, but is primarily uh, federally funded, uh, the judiciary administration, and it goes on and on and on. But but these you, where you need to look is these are, are these top five categories. The, the the places you look in each of those categories uh, is uh, with education with K through 12. You have to go look at the BSA. Uh, and the adjustments that are made to the BSA, which is how funds are distributed, how the education funds are distributed uh, to school districts uh, uh, in the state. The BSA was last set in, in 2008. Uh, the adjustments uh, uh, were last set, I think, in 2008. They mer- there may have been some modifications to them uh, since, but they haven't been looked at uh, in a while. Uh, Lynn Gaddis and Tammy Wilson co-chaired a committee in 2013, if I recall correctly, to try to dig into it. Uh, but that effort sort of uh, stalled out. Um, so there, there's, it's been a long time. What you have to do is to, to reduce K through 12, to reduce that top category of spending in 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 a, in a way that really impacts the budget. Is you have to reduce the BSA and you have to change the adjustments. That lowers dollars going to the school districts. And frankly, the knock-on effect of that is probably to increase the burden on local school districts to pay for themselves. Um, increase uh, local taxes uh, in a way that uh, that that uh, that pays for themselves. There's a second piece of that, which is the school construction money. The state is supposed to pick up uh, 100% of of school bonds. Uh, it doesn't. It, it's been cutting that uh, for the past uh, uh, few years uh, and shifting some of that burden to the to the local school districts. You would have to make that permanent. Uh, uh, as part of reducing the K through 12 spend, you'd have to make that permanent uh, by uh, by reducing the state share and increasing the local share. So, what happens is you can reduce it at the state level, but a significant share of this is going to pop up uh, at the local level. Second category is health and social services. That's a that's a billion one uh, uh, spending. It's been reduced over the last. Uh, uh, since 2015, by 13 percent, it's been reduced uh, a little bit more over the last uh, five years. Most of that cha- most of that reduction came in the in the early years, from 2018 to 2022. It's been reduced by about two percent. To get at that, the biggest pot of money that you can get at uh, in uh, health and social services is Medicaid. Roughly half of that amount is Medicaid. Roughly half the amount of Medicaid is optional services. Uh, Federal government, the way Medicaid works is if you have Medicaid, if a state opts into Medicaid, and all states have, uh, if you opt into Medicaid, there is a set of services that are mandatory that the the state has to provide. There's a set of services that are optional that the federal government will contribute toward uh, if uh, if the state provides those services. To, in Alaska, about Alaska has about 650 to 700 million. Uh, in Medicaid, about 300 to 350 million of that, roughly half, uh, is uh, is optional services. To get a big chunk of money out of health and social services, you have to go at those optional Medicaid services, and you have to reduce the number of optional 
uh, Medicaid services that Alaska is providing. The biggest pushback on that is from the medical industry, from Alaska's medical and health industry, who don't want, who don't want to see that funding leaving the state. I mean, if you cut back the state's 50, if you cut back optional services, the state saves money, but it also takes the federal money that matches the state money for those optional services, takes it out of the economy. So it's a, a the medical community, health community, views it as a double hit. Uh, and so, and so you, you're, you're, you're up against the docs, uh, who say, oh no, you can't, you can't cut that back because that's, a, that's, that's a big part of their funding sources. But that's, that's where you go to get at health and social services. Corrections, um, corrections is, uh, it is, it is, there's only two categories that have increased spending since 2015. Corrections is the biggest one of those by far. It's increased by 15.5%. If you look at it just since 2018, the last five years, uh, it's increased by 21.2%. That's a result of us, of us shifting back uh, the, 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 the view we had of criminal justice and in putting more people in jail. And when you put more people in jail, you have higher corrections expenditures. The way... <laughs> There's, corrections is sort of minimal. I mean, we're not we're not spending a whole lot on these prisoners. Uh, the way to control corrections spending is you reduce the number of people you're incarcerating, um, and 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 to do that, you've got to have uh, changes in the criminal justice system that don't incarcerate uh, that many people or don't keep them incarcerated. Um, and and that's I mean that's that's what you've got to focus on if you're trying to reduce uh, correction spending. University of Alaska. Um, it's been it's it's uh, uh, been reduced as I said 31.5 percent since 2015. It's been reduced 19 percent uh, since 2018 alone. That's a big chunk, but there's more to be had. Uh, we are still spending on the university. We're still spending more per full-time equivalent student than the lower 48. Even even adding an, an, a generous Alaska adjustment we're spending more per full-time equivalent student on our university system than elsewhere. The, the university has resisted going to one campus uh, with the rest of the campuses being, br uh, being branches. Uh, that's where the next big chunk of, uh, of savings is. Uh, if we, they've probably got it down to fairly bare bones, uh, keeping, the three camp keeping the three university systems that we've got. Uh, if we're going to make additional changes there, um, uh, we have to uh, we have to go into that three university system, but there, there's not a whole lot. We've gotten a lot of dollars. We've gotten 118 million dollars in change in in, in in reductions since 2015. Uh, there's not a whole lot more there to get us down. Maybe another 50 million dollars uh, if we go down to, to lower 40 full time equivalent uh, standards. Next category of spending is public safety. Uh, that's done the same thing. Corrections has it is the it is the only other category uh, since 2018 where spending has gone up. Um, it has gone up uh, 7 point or 2.4 percent since 2015. It's gone up 35 percent uh, since uh, since FY 2018. Uh, that again is a function of how we're viewing our criminal justice system. If if we want savings there, we've got to go into the criminal justice system and we've got to make changes where we're not. Uh, where we're not uh, 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 needing as many uh, police to enforce the criminal justice system we've got uh, uh, as as we've got currently. Uh, from there, you can get you can get nickels and dimes, frankly, in terms of the overall two billion dollar deficit. You can get nickels and dimes from places like uh, uh, reduce further reducing transportation. Recall the governor tried to do that by closing certain. Uh, transportation locations, one in particular on the uh, uh, on the road between Anchorage and Kenai, uh, and he gets a lot of pushback for that. But you can you can go and make some more reductions in uh, in uh, in transportation. Judiciary uh, has seen an in a slight increase over the last uh, uh, five years. Uh, administration uh, has uh, the Department of Administration seen an increase over the last five years. Uh, the legislature has increased uh, its spending. Uh, over the last five years, by 13 percent, but it's still only seven, seven million, seven, well, eight million dollars uh, in total, even with that increase. I mean, there's a lot of staffers down there. Maybe you go at staffers, but but the point is, 
that all these other categories are nickel and dime categories. They're not going to get you right. uh, the, two, the $2 billion. Right. They're, they're, again, diminishing returns. Once you get down below the top five, essentially, it's all diminishing returns for what's going on. Um, Brett asks a question, says, covering the state reduction with a school district increase of cost is a wash, not a true reduction. Uh, where do you think the district increases will come from? And I think this goes back to the government closest to the people is most responsive again, that if the people decide that they don't want to include those things in their local communities, they're they're you know best they're they're best equipped to handle that, right? Yeah, exactly right. And I and and and, and the example that I use often is is the the school buildings that we've built. We've built world class, a a class uh, school buildings, and it's nice. It's great to have them. But but what was happening was the local school board was deciding on the type of building they wanted, but the state's paying for it. So you 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 had this disconnect between between cost causation and cost responsibility that I think frankly in, ended up with with much more expensive school buildings uh, than we needed. If you push that if you push that cost responsibility down to the, to those who are causing the cost, I think they take a lot different view. Uh, of, uh, of of school buildings, and right. I think that's tra- I think that's translatable also over to uh, over to the to the instruction that uh, the course of instruction that they do. Well, no, and I agree with that because that's how it was sold to the communities. Oh, this is free money. Why wouldn't you want this for the children? It's free money. We're going to get free school buildings. That's how it was sold to people with no with no responsibility heaped on them for sure. I see there's a lot of shouting in the chat room, and it had to do with the fact that Brad said BSA base student allocation formula instead of the education funding formula. Uh, this is adjusting the BSA does zero unless you reform the unless you reform the education formula, zero this will do zero to resolve the annual budget deficit. Um, do you want to get down into the granularity of that, Brad, uh, between the difference between the BSA and the education formula overall? No, that's fine. That, that's fine. I mean, the, the, I, I said BSA plus adjustments. That, to me, is the education formula. You've got you to adjust both of them, but I'm not going to – I mean, that's, that's fine. If we want to call it education formula, great. Okay. Uh, here, go ahead. Here, here's the point, though, Michael. Um, uh, <laughs> we're doing things – I mean – I understand. I understand that people say, "Oh, we got to cut. We got to cut. We got to cut." But, but by the by the other the other side of that is people are saying, "Oh, but we got to do this. Government's got to do this. Government's got to do this." That really, to me, it really hits home when you look at corrections and public safety. If if people if people are sitting out there going, "Oh, I can you cut government. Just cut it all. I don't care. I don't care about government." We've got we 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 they John Cogill actually tried to do that with his with his criminal justice reform bill. We, uh, he tried to cut uh, corrections down. He tried to cut uh, public safety uh, spending down. And in the very in some of the very same people who are saying cut government, I don't care about government, get get rid of government, uh, are the ones who pushed back and said, oh no, we got to change the criminal justice system back. For good reason, but we got to change the criminal justice system back, which has popped corrections and public safety spending back up again. If people want to understand what's going on and what's driving spending in this state, just look at that as a microsm. The government tries to make a cut someplace, and, 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 and the public then sort of explodes and says, no, you can't do that. You've got you've to you've go back to where we were. And going back to where we were on corrections has popped that you know, popped that spending 21 percent over the last five years. It's moved it into the third highest category of spending uh, in the state. So that's right. what's going on all over the place. Right. Well, and I think I, when I look at your chart here, the biggest thing I see is the is the top two: education and early development (K-12) and health and social services. Part of this is that we're locked into this whole Medicaid, Medicare, this whole Medicaid formula, which is the lion's share of this. We've got one third of Alaskans on some form of Medicaid uh, right there uh, across the board. That's a billion plus dollars. I mean, that, that right there, that's one point one two billion dollars right now, uh, following the one point almost three billion dollars in early in uh, in K through twelve education. When we start looking at those things. 
Those are really, to me, the two biggest things that we need to look at. And we need to ask ourselves some questions. And I think by, for example, pushing some of these things back down onto the local communities, you're making them you're making them ask the hard questions. Do we really need the Cadillac when the Pontiac will get us there? You know what I mean? I mean, I think that's the question. And by the way, the Cadillac, we could get the Cadillac, but we're still driving around the hood because we still can't produce a good outcome for what we're getting right now. I mean, we need to rethink this whole thing. I think that's where most of those changes are going to come. We've got about a minute here. No, I, I, that's where, if we're going to make changes, that's where they've got to come. But you're going to see a huge pushback. I mean, Matsu, the Matsu local government pushes back on 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 pushing uh, on gov- on state government pushing those costs to local government. They don't want to see those costs coming to local government. They want to complain about the cost of state government, but they don't want to see those costs coming back to local government. One correction uh, that 1.1 billion in health and social services, only half of that's Medicaid and only half of the Medicaid uh, is optional services. So you're, you're looking to fix Medicaid it's a huge chunk. It's about the optional services are, you know, 300 to 350 million dollars. It's a huge chunk, but it's only that. You're not fixing Medicaid doesn't get you 1.1 billion dollars. Okay, and you're right. <clears throat> you're right on that. Okay, we're out of time, Brad. Uh, I appreciate you coming on and taking this uh, deep dive with us on this. Thank you for going the extra mile with us today. We appreciate it, Michael. My uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.